In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, but if, if we, we confess, confess our sins, God, God who, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a craven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land of the earth, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear fault witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the, foolish, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Beloved in the Lord, let us love one another, that united as one people in Christ, we might confess together our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of, of heaven, heaven and earth, and, and in, in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, Son our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, died, and, and was buried. He, he descended into hell, hell the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing together our sermon hymn for this morning, Cross of Jesus, Cross of Sorrow.
grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Being Jewish was special. Being Jewish was great. Imagine that the Lord who created all of the distant stars and galaxies had picked you to be his special people. And only you. Now, mind you, there are conditions to remaining God's special people. To keep being special, you had to uphold your end of the bargain. First, the commandments, all 10 of them, which we heard this morning from Exodus chapter 20. Got to keep them all and keep them good. And second, the sacrificial rites that the Lord gave to preserve the bargain. You've got to keep doing them. You got to keep the temple going. You got to keep the blood flowing and the smoke rising and the incense being burned. But if you keep all those conditions, keep the commandments, keep the sacrificial rites, then God is going to bless you. God's going to bless only you. And you get to continue to be God's special people. You get to be great. Now, what could be wrong with this picture? Well, according to Jesus, there's a lot wrong with this picture, enough to turn the tables on the whole idea. So what do I mean by that? Well, we have to go back in time, back past the age of Jesus, back all the way back to Sinai and the years following. In fact, even before Sinai, while the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, who we heard about the other weeks in our readings, were still slaves in Egypt. The temple that is going to be built much later was the place where the sacrificial rituals appointed by the Lord were supposed to take place before the mercy seat of God on the Ark of the Covenant. And the temple was a replacement for the tent of meeting that was first set up with the Israelites out in the wilderness, starting at Sinai. And it was that tent, the precursor to the temple, that was the entire point of the Exodus. If only Pharaoh had listened the first time Moses and Aaron came to speak with him. They went into Pharaoh and they said, according to Moses, Exodus chapter 5, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast for me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And Moses and Aaron said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. That's the reason why there was an exodus in the first place, that the Israelites might go out and worship God in their own special place, that the God who had chosen them would identify them as his special people. But of course, we know the story. And Pharaoh, despite all the plagues, would not let the people go. And so the Lord demonstrated that he alone was great, not Pharaoh, not the gods of Egypt or the great empire that was Egypt, that God alone was worthy of worship because he alone could act to save his people. And so these Israelite slaves are freed and they're brought out the mighty hand and an outstretched arm by the Lord out into the desert. And there the Lord makes with them a covenant. You will have no other gods before me. Not human gods, not idols, not false gods, not anyone. And you will serve one another by not killing each other, stealing from each other, committing adultery with other people's spouses or coveting their stuff. Now, what's the point of all this exodus? The point was that God was demonstrating that the false gods that Egypt had set up and that the Hebrews were being enticed to follow were not worthy of their worship. They were not good, and they certainly were not great. That all of the nations must repent and return to the Lord who can defeat empires, even an empire like Egypt, and raise up a ragtag group of slaves in their place. God, 
in the Exodus is making a great name for himself. Now, fast forward to Jesus's time, 1400 years in the future of the Israelites, 2000 years in our past. And now the tent of meeting that traveled around with the Israelites in the desert has been replaced by an actual stone temple. The second temple, the first one having been destroyed after Israel didn't keep the covenant. And this temple court, this second temple, has actually a series of courts like concentric circles, all moving out from the Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept behind the curtain, behind the veil, the place where God would come to forgive his people. And as you moved out in these concentric circles, you came to the outermost court. So you're in the temple, but just barely. And that outermost court was our court, unless any of you are of Jewish descent. It was the court of the nations, the ethnics in Greek, the Gentiles, our translations often put it. It was the only place that people like you and I who are not of Jewish descent could get close to God in. We couldn't go in any further, but at least there we could learn more about this great God of Israel who had delivered the people and who in fact wanted to not only be the God of Israel, but the God of all nations. Except just one problem. It's in that court of the Gentiles that the money changers and the sellers of animals had set up all their paraphernalia for the sacrifices that were being offered in the holy place, the second or the closest concentric circle to the Holy of Holies. So if you and I were to come in to try and learn about this great God, instead what we would see is pigeons and doves and whole bunch of currency exchange booths and all of that hardly conducive to worship. It's like trying to worship in the middle of a shopping mall at Christmas. So you could see where Jesus might be a little bit upset, but you could also see where the Jewish people might not have understood what the big deal was. After all, the whole reason why we've got the animals set up there and the pigeons and the money changers is so that the Jews God's special people, God's great people, could keep covenant with their God, do the sacrifices that God had appointed, carry out the rituals that God had given to Moses at Sinai. Hey, we're the great people and we're just going about our great business. What could possibly be the problem? The problem is that they had become focused on their own greatness and not the greatness of their God. They no longer had a space for the nations to come and learn about God's greatness because they were all consumed with being God's special people and carrying out God's special rights for their own sake, not for the sake of others. Now, this isn't a Jewish problem. This is a human problem because we are all tempted in the same direction. That's what it means to be sinful fallen human beings. We can all fall into the same trap of making ourselves great when the only great one is our God. So this morning we read from 1 Corinthians where Paul is having to deal with the church that is very excited about being Christian. These are new baby Christians. Some of them have probably only been baptized for months, if not years brand new to this religion that's being preached by the great apostle. And as we can see in the rest of Corinthians, as you walk through it, the Corinthians were in danger of letting their faith go to their heads too. Hey, we're special. We're great. We could do whatever we want. First Corinthians chapter five, Paul has to write to them, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. His father's wife, man. His mom? Mother-in-law? We're not certain. And you are arrogant, Paul writes. Ought you not rather to mourn? But hey, we're special. We're great. God picked us in Jesus. We could do whatever we want, right? 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, as Paul has to address the most sacred of all rituals that we participate in, the Lord's Supper, he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you, Paul writes? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Thus ends the reading. How can Paul remind these Corinthian Christians that it is not the greatness of the people that gives God glory, but the greatness of their God that glorifies the people? Well, to do that, Paul has to go back to first principles, and he actually starts his letter with those very first principles in the epistle reading we just had a few moments ago. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. God gives himself his own glory in his son at the cross. By grace, our great God, who has delivered us through his son at the cross, lifts up people like you and I and makes us his own. And as he makes us his own, he then leads us in the ways we ought to go as his people. It is the greatness of God that makes us great and not the other way around. And so going back to the Jews in the temple with Jesus, Jesus has to reorient, turn back to the east, literally the word means the temple, back toward bringing God to the people and not about a great people coming to God. And that means that a, the greatness of God has to be on display to all people and not just the Jews to the nations as well. Now, how bad have things gotten at this point? Well, they've gotten so bad that when God walks into his own temple to try and reorient things, <laughs> he's challenged on his own turf. Of course, John's already foreshadowed this in John chapter one, where he writes, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Here, after all, is what the Jews have been waiting for, God appearing in his temple, and here he is, and they're like, what sign are you going to do to show that you have authority for these things? But what Jesus is doing with the lust of our gospel reading, after the whole whipping and the money changer table team turning over and the freeing of the pigeons and the letting go of the ox, then, is that God is making his own temple. He's going to make his own tent. The fact that we've been allowed to make a temple for him is only emphasized, oh, hey, look how great we are. We've made this great temple. And God's like, fine, I'm going to build a better temple, the temple that I want, the temple that I have been looking for since the very beginning. And that temple is Jesus. He is the temple. In John chapter 1, Jesus says, the word became flesh and tabernacled, tented, became a temple among us. That's what is happening here. The new temple is coming into the old temple. And God is saying, I'm taking back over again. We're going to get you all off your high horse. And I'm going to glorify my own name rather than letting you continue to think you are the ones that are glorifying it. Destroy this temple, Jesus says, and I'll raise it up in three days. That's the message of the cross. Now, the Jews stumble over that message. God isn't in this dying man outside of the city 
on two pieces of wood killed by the Roman occupiers. No, God's in this temple that we built. And God's in all our good behavior and our moral actions and the wonderful people that we are. That's why they stumble over the cross. And the Greeks, our own culture, even here in Canada, mocks that whole message. That can't be where God is, if there's a God at all, on that cross, dying. But for you and I, we've come to see in that cross the greatness of God. That a God who would choose to die for his people does so even while we were still enemies. That God chooses to take our sin upon himself rather than leaving us to wallow in it. And so Jesus makes us special again. But we have to be constantly reoriented ourselves back to that basic message, that we aren't great because we glorify God in Christ Jesus. God has glorified himself in Jesus and his cross, and he makes us great in him. Now, that could be a real downer to your self-esteem. And certainly there are a lot of Christians out there that are like, no, 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 no. God chooses us because he sees that we're going to first choose him. Or, or God chooses us because we made a decision for Jesus. Or, or, or God chose us because he looked deep into our hearts and said, hey, that's, that's the kind of person I want in my kingdom, to be a brick in my temple. But, but we don't play that game. And we know we don't play that game because the first thing we do, whether it's on Zoom or it's in person, is we stand up before God and say, I, a poor, miserable sinner. Look at who I am. Look at what I bring to the table, which is nothing. And we're going to be completely honest about it before God. And we don't do this to make ourselves feel bad. That isn't the point. What we're doing when we confess our sins in that way is it's our way of turning over the tables of our own hearts and minds. Looking at the money changers that want to take up residence in our court and saying out with you, I do not want my heart to be a den of robbers and thieves, but a place where my Lord can take residence. And to do that, I first have to see what has to be overturned and let go. So that when the Lord comes, he comes and takes that empty court and makes it a great place for himself in us. And then we know that it's his work and not ours. Some of you may not know the story of Samuel Morse, except to know that he's responsible for Morse code. But as many great inventors were, uh, thinking of Leonardo da Vinci as just a great example, he started life as an artist. He was actually born into a preacher's home in New England two years after George Washington was elected the first president of the United States. And after finishing his education at Yale, which used to be a good Christian university, he went to England so that he could hone his painting skills. When he came back to America, he was recognized as a very gifted artist, and he started to be in demand all over the place. And it was sadly, while he was in Washington, D.C., on a commission, that his wife died. He didn't receive the news until it was too late. He couldn't make it back to her bedside. And in his absolute heartbreak, as having lost the love of his life, he left painting behind and decided to try and invent a means of rapid communication over great distances, which of course eventually led to the discovery of the telegraph. Now, despite all of the fame and honors that came his way, and there were lots, A, because he was a great painter, and B, now he's invented a means of communication that didn't involve ponies or people running really fast. Despite all of that, Morse never was proud or boastful. And in a letter to his second wife, he wrote this, the more I contemplate this great undertaking, the more I feel my own littleness, and the more I perceive the hand of God in it, and how he has assigned to various persons their duties, he being the great controller, all others, his honored instruments. Hence our dependence, first of all, on God, 
and then on each other. When we walk around in pride, conceited at our own talents and accomplishments and how great we are, we are demonstrating that we do not understand or appreciate the role that God holds in everything that we do. None of us can succeed by our own strength or wisdom. It is God who makes all things possible, which is why Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians chapter four, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not? The Jews thought they were great because they had a great temple and they picked out a great God. We can be tempted to think the same. We're great because of our works. We're great because of how good we are and how kind we are and how generous we are and how faithful at worship we are. But it is not a great people that make a great God. It is a great God who chooses for himself and makes a great people. Our God came in the flesh, looked at our wretchedness, and turned all the tables over, opened the cages, sent the sin flying, and said he would make us into a real house of prayer, a real temple, a fitting dwelling for our God. And by grace, that is where our great God is living still, in the spirit who came through Jesus, making us right with God. And that's what's truly great. Amen. May the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ guard and keep you always in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our jealous God, save the third and fourth generations that will come after us from your punishment by filling us with your son's zeal for your house in these Lenten days, that we may cast out every idol from our hearts and love only you and your commandments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our God, you have brought us out of slavery to sin through Christ Jesus, whom you have made to be our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Bless all those whom you send to preach Christ crucified to us, especially Pastor Gerald Paul as he assumes his duties in the Cayman Islands, that we may ever know and live in the truth of your power in his cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, preserve and bless all Christian households, that husbands and wives would live in love and service to each other, that fathers and mothers would diligently bring up their children in your fear and honor, and that children would honor their parents be well equipped for service to their neighbors in this life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord of the perfect law, you have called us to honor our parents and all other authorities, that it might go well with us in our lands. Bless Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, our parliaments, legislatures, national assemblies, and all of our executives, and all those who watch over and govern us in your stead. Make them wise in your ways, that your justice may be upheld among us and help us to serve and obey them in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, whose steadfast love in Christ is good, turn in your abundant mercy to Olive, Massey, Carrie, Catherine, and all who suffer in our midst that we name before you in our hearts. that the flood may not sweep over them, nor the pit close its mouth on them. Deliver them from sinking into the mire and deep waters and grant them healing, comfort, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our rock and redeemer, as three days after the temple of your son's body was destroyed by wicked men, he raised it up again. Grant that on the last day, we and all the saints who now rest in your presence may share in the glory of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn before our benediction is In the Cross of Christ I Glory. bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.